On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. In the same manner, likewise, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and drink, this is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. As we receive the bread and the wine in the Lord's Supper, we may wonder, what blessings did Jesus intend for us? We may also counter any doubts with Jesus' words, given and shed for you for the remission of sins. Hi, I'm Pastor Larson. We're connected in many ways with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, and we're happy that you're with us this morning. I want to announce that beginning today, the broadcast of this Bible study will be at 9.30. 9.30. Not at 10, as this slide shows. All right? And we'll try that for a while. 9.30 on, on Sunday. Trinity Lutheran Church invites you to worship. We're at 400 North Swinton in Delray Beach. And you can, you can worship with us in person or online at 8.30 and at 10.30. All right. We're talking about the Lord's Supper. One of the greatest gifts that Jesus gave to his church on the night in which he was betrayed. The circumstance was the celebration of the Passover. And then Jesus did something different. He gave his body and blood in with and under the bread and the wine. That mystery, unexplained, is given to us when we receive his body and blood. So I'm going to pause right away at the beginning. For all of you who are in our study uh, live this morning, and this is Saturday morning for us, do you have any questions? And maybe we can answer them this morning. Yeah. Okay. Keep that in mind that I want you to interrupt at any time for clarification, for questions, for application. All right? You are welcome here. All of you. All of you. So let's get started. If uh... The Lord's Supper, we're going to look at three or four questions. Number one, what did Jesus intend for us? Emphasis on for us. And what are the blessings that he gives to us in the Lord's Supper? And finally, and I think we will get to this today, what is the proper reception of the Lord's Supper? Perhaps that's more pertinent uh, to your life in the church from week to week as you desire to go to the sacrament and receive what Jesus intends, his blessings. What use did Jesus intend when he gave us his body and blood? Well, the words are simple. The words are very simple and common to our experience. Take, eat, and drink of it, all of you. Eat and drink. That's, that's the use. Drink of it, all of you. Now, I want to emphasize all because uh, there is, oh boy, I don't want to get into that right now, but it's also that eat and drink. And we're not a congregation, we're not a, a church body that withholds the cup from the lay people. We receive both the bread and the wine both the body and blood of Jesus Christ. The sacrament was not given to us to adore. There are churches, and I'm not doing the polemical exercises in this study. If you want to do it sometime, I think it would be interesting, but uh, that's not what we're doing this morning. But there are churches in which 
the people bow down and worship the bread that is still on the altar from the previous celebration of the Lord's Supper. But we are not commanded in any way. And as a matter of fact, the Lord's body is not still on the altar from the last celebration. It's also true that in our church body, the Lutheran faith, we do not believe that we are to reenact in an unbloody way the sacrifice of Jesus on the altar every time we have the sacrament. That's not commanded. It is not anywhere implied that we are reenacting. We are doing what Jesus said. I give you this wine and I give you this blood and with it my body and blood period. And then there are the blessings. The sacrifice is complete, and it, it may never be reenacted. We can remember it, which we do, but we are not reenacting the sacrifice. Is that clear, or does it raise questions for you? Mm -hmm. oh. Okay. I have a question, because um, what do you mean reenact? my sacrifice on the altar. I, I Could you explain that a little further? The priest in some churches is reenacting, replaying, redoing the sacrifice that Jesus had on the altar. I cannot explain why that worldwide church um, teaches that but it is in their catechism. Mm. And you'd have to go and ask a, a priest. Mm. Or perhaps, uh, you know what we all do? We, we, go, to, we go to YouTube or we go to uh, uh, some search engine and we look it up. Yes. Now, as I've been doing each week, and some of you uh, would like this and some of you just uh, delete it, then that's okay. But what I've been doing every week is to send you the slides. And I do that so that you can review it if you want, but also so that questions like yours can be searched because you have the words that I talked about. And also, more importantly, the Bible verses um, that are pertinent to the Bible study are all put there for you. And you can look them up in your own Bibles. You can look at the context, which you should do. And then... Uh, you can study it pensively or more slowly or at any use you want to make of it. And uh, deleting it is, is just fine with me. I, I don't have any, my pride is not injured at all when you do that. All right. Thank you, sir. But any questions? This is a, the, the, the Lord's Supper has many differences among the many church bodies throughout the world. And that's an understatement. The Lord's Supper, what blessings do believers receive in this supper? And I think you know the answer to that. Anybody want to tell us what they remember from their teachings, the catechism, adult uh, education? What are the blessings we receive in the Lord's Supper? Forgiveness of sins. Forgiveness of sins. Uh, the resurrection. The connection with Jesus' resurrection? Yes, indirectly directly what what does uh, luther say if you have forgiveness of sins you also have life and salvation correct there is no life and salvation without the forgiveness of sins it is a mystery how jesus does this but he does it through his word and his promise his word and promise are attached to the lord's supper by Jesus. Any other blessings that you know you receive? I would, you have it. Go ahead, Judy. Oh well, I, I this is probably more to baptism, but I always think of new life um, after the forgiveness of sins. You have a new day. 
Oh, new start. Yeah. Yes, we often say that you receive strength to amend your sinful life and, and live a more holy life. And that is because you you stare into the face of Jesus uh, indirectly, and you realize that you can't escape. Mm -hmm. He knows you, and he knows you need this. And anyone who comes away with an unrepentant heart, well, he has to deal or she has to deal with Jesus. Now look at this passage, which we know very well. What does Jesus say? Take eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant. Covenant. That's a word that you don't use every day. The covenant is God's promise to us. It doesn't require anything of us except to receive it, to believe it. But we can't do anything to improve it or change it. You can't change Jesus' covenant. And the blood of the covenant is the blood through which we receive the forgiveness of sins, okay? Mm -hmm. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And that's given to all who believe this. There is no forgiveness of sins for those who do not believe that Jesus made the sacrifice and shed his blood, which is in, in, which is in the sacrament, poured out, given to us. All right. Mm -hmm. The Lord's Supper. How are these blessings poured into the Lord's Supper? I see the supper is ready. The veil is over the elements, and now that part of the worship service begins, and the consecration is made. Well, how are the blessings that we're talking about given in the supper? And it's really very simple. It's the word it's of Jesus. Through his word, yeah, through his word spoken over the elements. That's right. His words that were spoken 2,000 years ago, minus 30, this is my body, this is my blood. Those are what put it in. And I, I think there's a way to see this in a kind of a diagram. How do believers receive these blessings in the supper? And the answer is by faith. The way we receive any spiritual blessing, by faith. In Jesus who died for me, for my sins, he shed his precious blood for me. And if you've been in my Bible studies any time in the last 10 years, you remember how many times I wanted you to underline the words for me. To make a, a vision of the cross and put under it, he died for me. He shed his blood for me. You understand? Make it personal. Our sins for for us that's that's true in the in the objective sense out there for all believers uh, to take hold of. It's by faith in Jesus' word that we receive the blessings. Right? Now this is the diagram I was talking about. Here is a simple diagram of the wafer, the bread, and the cup in which uh, the wine has been poured. And so it's the word, this is my body, this is my blood given and shed for you, quote, for the forgiveness of your sins. That puts the blessings into the supper. No other action or word is able to do that. Christ's word is powerful and able and it actually affects what he says. I believe that with all my heart. I believe it deeply. I know that it's true. Well, now I'm talking about my reception. Can you see the word faith down there, or has it been obscured? It's yeah. there. It's there. Okay. On my screen, it's partially obscured because I have to have it couple extra things on the bottom, but I want you to realize that it is faith that receives the, the, the blessings. 
and by no other means. Now, this is one of the two sacraments, baptism being the other. Sometimes the third is added, the absolution. But we're talking about the two sacraments, the Lord's Supper and baptism. And we have to admit, and we should always know this, how many of you knew that the word sacrament is not in the Bible? Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Okay. Now, why has the church invented the word sacrament? The word sacrament uh, is the comes from a Latin word, and that Latin word is a synonym of a Greek word, which has to do with the mystery, the mysterion. And this is one of the mysteries of the New Testament. You know the mysteries of the New Testament. You know some of them. Jesus is God and man in one person. Mm -hmm. The Trinity, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is another word not found in the Bible. Did you know that? The word Trinity is not. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. The teaching is Matthew 28, 20, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go to Jesus' baptism. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I've taught you that before. The other mysteries, uh, one is the mystery of the Gentiles coming into the church, which Paul talks about in one of his letters. I can't list all the mysteries, but here is one of the chief mysteries because it is beyond our understanding. It cannot be explained. And what I have to you on the screen now, that the benefits are given and received, given by Jesus and received by faith. Do you have any questions about this idea? All right. I didn't put many discussion questions in the slides, so. What else does Jesus intend? Or what else is there? What does Jesus intend when he gives us this supper? Well, he gives it in remembrance of him. Oh, you're on the ball, Judy. Thank you. <laughs> Number those one. Are, those are words spoken. <laughs> because Jesus says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. Now, are there church bodies in which this is the chief thing? The remembrance part. And they have it on the altar. And that's okay. We are doing this. And this is Jesus' word. But it's not his only word. So we do it in remembrance. Can you think of the other reason that I might have put up here? Why does he give us the supper? We already have discussed the forgiveness of sins. So this is the what else beside that. Remembrance and... Time's up. <laughs> to proclaim his death. This is a sentence that you probably, uh, when, you, when you were a child and you went to catechism, you may have memorized 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. Now, maybe the pastor didn't assign this one for your memory work because he didn't want to assign 10 Bible verses. So he, he gave, what I did as I gave three a week. <laughs> to me, three or, or even two if one was long. <laughs> but who's writing? St. Paul has received from the Lord that which he also passed on to the church there in Corinth. For our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. You see that St. Paul repeats almost verbatim, the, the words of Jesus in Matthew and Mark and Luke. And then Paul adds this, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death. What death was that? The death that he died for the forgiveness of sins. You see, so Paul makes the connection. And there's what I used to say in the sermon is that every time you go to the sacrament, you are you are pro, you're you're preaching a sermon. 
Well, not really. You're proclaiming that you believe the Lord died for you. And you're going to do this as long as you live. And the church is going to proclaim the Lord's death for the forgiveness of sins until he comes. And then <laughs> after that, there'll be no reason and no necessity uh, to do this because death has been conquered. It's over. There is no more death as the book of Revelation proclaims. So every time you go to the sacrament, you are personally proclaiming he died for you. And the people see that. Just like when we all stand and confess the creed, what we believe, we're doing it together and we're hearing each other's words. And those words, they reinforce the words that we believe. We don't believe this alone or in a vacuum, but with all the other Christians on earth. I believe in God, the Father Almighty. When you go to the sacrament, you are proclaiming with all true Christians on earth who believe what Jesus taught. I am proclaiming you died for me, and I am receiving you in this supper. The supper has always been for me a special moment. I know there were times that I must admit I did it without true reverence, but I repent of that, and I'm sorry for that. There are I'd like to get to that later. I have some quotes from Martin Luther that I could add here, but it, I'd rather wait till we talk about a worthy reception, all right? Why, why should I receive the blessings of the supper often? Do you have any uh, personal answers for receiving it often? Well, we are, we are sinners and probably as shortly after we do take the Lord's Supper, um, we've sinned, even those sins of omission that we're not aware of. Um, right. Psalm, Psalm 51, cleanse me also from presumptuous sins, sins I was not aware of. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and to keep us close to the Lord. It keeps us close to the Lord. Yes, it does. I should do it often because of remembrance going Jesus back. Jesus says, do this. You see, there is a command there. Now, the Lord's Supper, I want to say, is 100% gospel. There is no law in what he gives us. When, when God is giving us something, there's no law in it. We simply receive it with, with the, the hand of or the heart of faith. But there is a command that is put in here for the guidance and continued reception of the Lord's Supper. And if you translate this, do this literally, it's be doing this. It's a constant action. It's part of worship. We will talk later about are there any times when you should abstain? But I'm not going to bring that up now to just delay or interrupt our receiving it often. And there's another reason. And that is that it is, as you said, Judy, for the forgiveness of sins. I have a daily need for forgiveness. And here in the sacrament, I receive God's forgiveness, the blood shed for Jesus is given to me and I go because of my need. In the front of the hymnal, just before the first hymn, if you have your hymnal open on a Sunday morning while the offering is being received or during, uh, during the prelude is a good time, if you turn and open your hymnal to the just a page or two before the first hymn, you will find 20 questions on the proper reception of the Lord's Supper in preparation for the Lord's Supper. Now, they are drawn from the Bible by Dr. Martin Luther that he intends that we 
use before we go to the supper. This is not, uh, he says, this is not child's play. There is a seriousness to the preparation. I know how it is. You come into church and you didn't realize it's a communion Sunday. Second and fourth for us early service people. Well, suddenly you come in and you see, you see the, uh, the elements of the Lord's Supper somewhere in the, in the, in the, in the chancel. I know it's moved due to the COVID-19, but you realize suddenly, oh, it's Lord's Supper. I forgot. <laughs> well, there's a time to make preparation. The Lord's Supper, why should I receive the blessings of the Lord's Supper often? Well, it was also the practice of the early church. In Acts 2.42, I would like you to read that. Um, Judy, would you start us off? Sure. Uh, why should I receive the blessings of the supper often? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers, Acts 2, 42. This was the practice of the church from the beginning. <clears throat> Pardon me, I was clearing my throat and then I lost the screen. Yes. Now, it was kind of interesting to me as I read the New Testament after the Gospels. It's there in Acts 2.42. There is another brief mention of it later in the book of Acts, I believe. And then you, except for Corinthians, where Paul writes of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11, and that's it. I often wonder, well, why didn't Paul bring it up in the letters that he wrote to the Ephesians and the Colossians and the Philippians? And he didn't bring it up. The only answer I have, and it's purely a guess, there was no problem. There was no reason. Often those letters were occasioned by one or more problems in the church to which Paul was writing. It's also not written in the book of Hebrews in a direct way, the Lord's Supper. Okay. Uh, it's not in one of, in any of John's uh, letters or in Jude. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's not directly the institution of the Lord's Supper in the Gospel of John. I believe John chapter 6 is an allusion to the supper which Jesus will one day institute on the night in which he was betrayed. You may have not realized that before. It's sometimes difficult for us to take into our minds the entire New Testament in one, in one thought. But the more you go over it, you realize, oh, it's not there. It's not there either. Okay? If you find it there, then let me know, and then I'll correct myself. Now, here is the question which begins a discussion of what is a proper reception of the Lord's Supper, which I've already alluded to in, in the 20 questions that Dr. Martin Luther drew up for Christians to use before going to the supper. Have you ever seen those 20 questions before? Any of you? I don't remember uh, the yeah. questions, but I remember uh, my parents as a kid, they would have to call the minister the night before and uh, tell them that they wanted to register for communion. And he would ask them, they would have a discussion. I don't know what it was, but uh, yeah, it was a very uh, serious um, a thing to have communion. Yes, and it still is and should be. The reason for the announcement was so that the pastor would have an, ex an ex 
an opportunity to find out if any members of the family had anything, any spiritual questions about their life and their faith that they would like to ask or confess. It was never required. It is in the Catechism in the uh, fifth chief part, uh, the uh, Confession and Absolution. Now, we have incorporated a general confession and absolution into the, the worship. That's just a practice, and it's a good practice. But it is hardly time for someone to become personal about a particular sin which bothers them. When we make a law out of it, we are binding some people to something that God has not commanded. That is, we don't, in our church, go into a confessional booth at least once or twice a year. And no one asks us how long since your last confession. But it's a worthy practice that you and I avail ourselves of a private confession whenever we are burdened by a particular sin or a difficulty in overcoming a sin. And any of your pastors would be open to your doing this. It happens more often than you know. It happens uh, often in a nonchalant way when a person comes into the pastor's office and says, uh, uh, Pastor, do you have a few minutes? Oh, <laughs> uh, something's been bothering me. And that happened many times when I was a full-time pastor at a Redeemer in West Palm. It was not a formal requirement, but someone came in and said, I need to talk to someone about this. And I kept it private forever and ever. That was my vow to the church and my vow to the person who was coming in to confess. And some of the times we actually went out to the altar and the person knelt and received the absolution. And that was a joyful moment. We had tears of joy in those times. I wish it would happen more often. I know it happens often that people are bothered by something they have done or failed to do. It's often uh, something within the family and they can't talk to anybody else. But they know if they talk to the pastor, it will be private and that they will have God's word to apply to it. I knew of a pastor in Chicago Pastor Corby, K-O-R-B-E, who brought this into his church in a very effective way. It's a long story. I can't get into the details here. But this is part of the examination, and most of us do it privately. How should I examine myself? Oh, Paul has a word on this. Um, who's next in, the, in reading? Evelyn? Okay. How should I examine myself before communion? 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three to 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. 
let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Oh. Are you familiar with this passage in 1 Corinthians 11? Uh, I, another reader? No, I'm um, I'm uh, going over it again. I'm asking oh, you good, good. It's if a, you remember it. Covers it, a lot. It does cover a lot. I think from back when I was a, um, a young 13, 14 year old in confirmation that I can remember the pastor saying that if we went up there with poor intentions or unforgiveness or or not even having our mind concentrating on what the whole meaning of the Lord's Supper was. We really were damning ourselves for the most part was the word he used then. Wow. It's, um, it's a poor translation in the King James. Um, now, this is a rehearsal of the words of Jesus that we studied in the Gospels, all right? Mm -hmm. And then as often as you eat, you proclaim. I received from the Lord. We don't know how and where Paul received it from the Lord. But he knows it. He, he knows it verbatim. Now, if you eat and drink in an unworthy manner, and that has to be defined, and we'll try to do that this morning. Guilty concerning the body and blood. Examine yourself. And then, after examining yourself, in what regard, you know, we have to do some study. And then, so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body. Now, you speak correctly, uh, Judy, when you talk about the pastor saying, if you have a sin that you have not believed is a sin, in other words, you deny that it's wrong and you excused yourself rather than confessing to God that I have sinned and fallen short in this particular regard. Or if you have refused to forgive another, and that's a that's a heavy thing to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we have uh, we have to work on that, don't we? Or if you are taking the supper without belief that this is the true body and blood of Jesus in with and under the bread and the wine, then you are drinking unworthily. Now also we add to this, if you refuse to amend your sinful life, if you have no intention, if you are in a bit and hen, oh, you have to use an and before the H, don't you? If you are practicing an habitual sin and you do not intend to stop sinning the next moment, the next opportunity on Monday, well, then you are coming with an unrepentant heart. And that is simply wrong to say, I want your grace and forgiveness, but I don't intend to change. You see what you are saying to the Lord? That is uh, contrary to what Paul teaches in Romans chapter 6. What are we um, giving ourselves to to become its slave? Are we still a slave to that sin that we're refusing to give up? Yes. Well, then... Decide who you're going to be a, a servant of, the Lord or, or your sin. Or the sin, yes. All right, you decide. Because whoever is submits to it is a slave to it. Well, that's a pretty heavy teaching. And the Lord intends for it to be a heavy teaching. I'm being as pastorly kind as I know how. Because I know personal experience and the experience that I've met in other people how destructive this can be to faith. 
you have to go again to Psalm 51 and to David's experience as the, oh, the, the worn out example, but the, the example that the Lord intends for us, a very righteous person destroys and has to come and be examined, not by himself because he refused to be examined by himself. He had to be examined by the prophet. And then that prophet says, you are the man, and David must now confess. I, I also, and my sin wrought this deep affliction. And you are looking at the cross, and see, you are imagining in your mind that exhibit of the great sacrifice of Jesus, and you were realizing that my sin put him there. I don't bring in all the other people in the world. We're talking about you. Mm -hmm. And so when you go to the sacrament of the altar to receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ, you are doing this in a worthy manner because you confess your sin. You want the Lord's help in in, in changing you, because especially if you found yourself unable to have the will to change. Well, there's help from the Lord. Come unto me, all ye that labor, labor, and are heavy laden, Le heavy laden with your sin burden, with your guilt. Come to him. It's the only place you're going to find the forgiveness that you seek. Repentance is a big thing. And the Lord intends that our repentance be a daily habit. On Sunday, then, it's no big... It, <laughs> let me rephrase that. On Sunday, it's not like you haven't confessed all week long. Not only in private devotions, but then suddenly when the, when the Lord brings to your mind or the devil exa examines you and he points to you. Yes, Jesus died for that. So your preparation does not start at 8.30 on Sunday morning. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying to you. It's a daily thing. You have to work at that. So let's talk about this uh, a little bit more. What does it mean to receive the supper in an unworthy manner? I'm checking our time here. I have to do it in like 55 minutes so we don't run into the 10.30 service on Sunday. Let's find out what it means, unworthy manner. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. What's the unworthy manner? Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body. Yeah. Now, the word discern means to look at something or believe something in the heart and mind that you know to be true and to realize in that instant that it is true and it is true for you. In this case, what is true is that the body and blood of the Lord are present, now listen to me carefully, and received by all communicants. It is not my faith that puts the body and blood of the Lord into the supper. What did we say puts those blessings into the supper? Faith. Faith. No. What puts it into the supper? Faith receives. Jesus' oh, words. Christ's words. Christ's words. His, his words spoken if you want to be a little more accurate, mm -hmm. 1970 years ago or so. Now, if I don't discern that the body and blood are present and received by me, we're talking about a personal thing. Well, I believe that your body and blood are present and that I am receiving it. 
back when we were going to church regularly and receiving the sacrament regularly in in the church. Jeannie and I have not been there. When we were receiving that, I was grateful for the chance to examine myself in the pew and sometimes on the way up to the sacrament while I stood in line with the others waiting for our table, our chance to go to the table. You understand? Mm -hmm. So I had an, a, another few moments. Just me and the Lord. And I'm telling him and remembering his words. It's not always the same. I don't think it was ever on two occasions the same as any other time. Now, you don't have to do that. That was my practice. What does it mean to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner without discerning the body? The word discern means to perceive or to know or to regard with the eyes of faith what Jesus' word means. This is my body. That's all it means. When I stop at a light and I'm driving, I discern very carefully the difference between red and green and sometimes yellow. You know what people believe about yellow, speed up and get through the intersection. <laughs> Causes accidents. That's why there's a one or two second delay. See, I perceive all that with my mind but I want to be, uh, I want to be safe. Okay. You have any questions about that perception idea? <coughs> have you thought about that? Okay. You know, there's a, the other side of the coin here. This passage that we read from 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and following has also had the effect of some people use that or their heart is confused. And some people have stayed away from the sacrament because they believe they are unworthy. Now, what should we do if we feel that we're unworthy? Luther goes into great uh, detail on that in, in the large catechism. I don't have time to get that before our eyes this morning. I have it ready, but it doesn't, um, our time prevents it. I don't believe, tell me if I'm wrong, that this sentence in verse 29 has ever or at least not recently, kept you from receiving the supper? No, I, I, I think it goes back to um, reinforcing your faith sometimes, helping to strengthen you also when you are, how do I say, sitting on the line sometimes? When you're not sure? Well, yeah, I, I guess, you know, there, that, there could be those times, and yet, yet in your heart you know the right manner, but... Um, you need you need extra strength. You need extra uh, help. You need you call on the Lord for help. That's right. Dealing with a certain problem. Oh, good. A, a sin you can't. You're having a hard time getting rid of or whatever. And to believe that you are forgiven mm -hmm. is one of the highest joys. To believe you're unforgiven is one of the most terrible things that can happen to a Christian. To doubt the forgiveness. I don't I want any of you to ever be there or any of the people that you know and love. And sometimes you are the person which 
you are the person who can give to another person the assurance of forgiveness by speaking the, the Lord's words. And I don't mean just concerning the supper, but concerning why did Jesus die? Mm -hmm. So I always try to pause for your questions, and we're going to wind this up. I'm, I'm aiming for uh, 55 minutes. Sorry to be so time conscious. The next time, um, God willing, we'll go into what if I don't feel worthy, okay? And I have some good words for that. Not today. Any other questions at all about the Lord's Supper? Pastor, I, I had to cut out a little bit, but I'll just have to listen tomorrow at 9.30 in the morning. Okay. And you can call me or text me anytime. Thank you. I think this is a, it, it's a good review to, to go through some of these, um, <clears throat> I guess some of these, um, what we would call basics from, from when we were uh, taught young. And as I get older, forget. We and do. Or maybe you. And review. And reinforce. Good. And new applications come to mind. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the meaning, as, as they all say, God's word is living. And at different times in your life, uh, things mean become more or they become alive or the light bulb comes on and the meaning of the of, of Christ's word as as they say in the Bible it is living it's a living word it speaks to you in a uh, more direct way of where you are in your place in life at whatever age that's true it's a good good place for us to stop and and, and pray about this wonderful gift Lord God, uh, this mystery that is before us in the study of your word is, uh, is powerful. That you gave us something that you knew we needed for our heart and our soul to reflect upon, for us to know and believe and to receive with faith the gifts that you offer to us in the Supper of the Lord and that we receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ for our, our forgiveness and for the assurance that we have eternal life by faith in him. Please grant to us a worthy reception of the supper every time we go, that we examine ourselves and find that we do indeed believe that your body and blood are received by us and that we intend to amend our sinful lives and ask for you to give us the strength to put away uh, the deeds of the flesh and to seek instead the fruit of the Spirit. We ask you for help in this way, and we have no other helper but you, Lord God. We pray this through Jesus, your Son who gave himself for us, that we might have forgiveness of sins and life and salvation. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.